Hello, and my name is Julie Hirschberg from Reactive Physical Therapy. Today I'm hanging out in my hotel room in the beautiful Chicago at the APTA Next Conference. And really, I am here because of my good friend, colleague Beth Fisher, received the John H.P. Mailey Award and did just a phenomenal, inspiring lecture this morning. And I really wanted to share it with our PT community, um, our friends here, our clients, because I think she today really got to a lot of the heart of why we do what we do and how we do it. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Beth Fisher. I am so lucky to call her my friend, colleague, mentor, confidant. Um, She's just an overall amazing person. But she's a physical therapist and researcher um, who is at USC, both in the biokinesiology and physical therapy and the neurology department. So. That alone is pretty amazing. She runs the neuroplasticity lab at USC, which is also very cool. And really her life, her life's work has been in um, helping people achieve their maximum potential through a movement. She teaches movement analysis at USC and she received this award so well deserved and did a lecture today at, at the conference. And I think the name, the title was so perfect for her, Beyond Limits, Unmasking Potential Through Movement Discovery. So that alone, I think, uh, was pretty exciting for me just to have that um, that idea of beyond limits um, that there really is no limit and this goes to um, that idea too that I had talked about before of um, no plateau no plateau in recovery and um, Beth is a really big proponent of that as well so I wanted to highlight a few really huge take-home points from her lecture just to share with you all um, today since I, since I got to see it live. Um, so I think one of the biggest pieces that has really driven um, Beth's career and her focus clinically has been this idea that there's a potential that people have movement capabilities and capacity that is masked by compensation. And as therapists then, we have to help uh, counter this tendency for compensation. So the perfect example, and she had these really great videos, by the way, um, old rancho videos and just really great before and after videos to show this. So a really good example would be if somebody early on post-stroke, for example, the only way they could get up out of chair would be to use really primarily a limb that was less involved from the stroke. And, you know, as maybe they regained capacity, they never really realized that they could use the limb like they really wanted to. And she actually had a, um, a patient, I'm trying to remember exactly what he, um, what he said, oh yeah, this is it, I, I wrote it down, um, where he had been moving his leg with his hand, right, instead of actually moving, moving it himself. And, and she was like, okay, well, why don't you try to move it? And he does, and he says, I didn't know I could do that. And so she really pushed us as physical therapists to help our patients discover these capabilities that were masked by compensations. Compensations that may have occurred because early on you couldn't do it. Um, but over, over time, that compensation actually led to a movement problem. And so this is really the underlying principle that Beth set her, um, her lecture upon. And 
what she advocated for it as a whole therapeutic community, this need to recognize that the deficits that we might see in movement are not just from the pathology or the neuropathology, as the case in a lot of our um, uh, clients, but they actually might be physical or biomechanical consequences of the compensation or of the chosen movement strategy. So she went on and um, I think very boldly did this to strike up some conversation. Um, and I thought this was really nice. She went to contrast this to the current approach. So I don't know if you all know, but the APTA has been really putting together this movement systems approach. And Beth and I actually sat on the initial task force for this as well. She went to push a little bit that um, you know, in the movement systems approach, there's an emphasis on the, you know, direct kind of underlying impairments that might contribute to a movement dysfunction. And Beth was advocating for an, an emphasis as well on the response response to those impairments. So not just that there might be weakness, but what does the person do in their movement, in their patterns because of that weakness? Um, so what's the response? What's their choice? What's the compensations? And how important that is and how powerfully we can affect people. It's very amendable to treatment. I think that's what's really cool about this approach. Um, she, uh, you know, in addition to these great videos from, um, from patients pre and post, um, looking at unmasking their potential, she had, uh, a recent study out of one of the labs at USC, um, I think just from this year, and it was a recent ACL study. And these were people who had ACL injuries, um, had f went through their full rehab process. This is so fascinating. So fully recovered, right? And they did a, um, a sit to stand task with force plates. So uh, I, I think, you know, sit to stand is something we do all the time, right? So what they found, and she had this great graph to show it, excuse me, um, is that post ACL fully recovered, drastically different loading in their sit to stand loading meaning they had a lot less weight on that um the acl repaired knee even though they were way post-surgery and and considered fully recovered so this is not just for our patients who are neurologically involved this could be post acl we develop these patterns these compensations that work really well and can be hard to change. So um, I found I found that particular graph um, really interesting. And so what um, what I love about Beth is her advocacy for what we can do. She's, our role as therapists is to help patients discover their hidden capabilities. And she actually got a few. Um, uh, calls and claps when she made a statement because she showed this really um, dramatic video, to be honest. It was dramatic in how undramatic it was, if that makes sense. So she showed a video that's actually on um, the APTA website um, where a person had completed an intense therapy round and really had improved their walking speed. And it showed a pre and post video. They um, improved their assistive device. So they went from a quad cane to a single point cane. They walked a lot faster. So absolutely a lot faster. But it was very clear in the pre to post that their walking pattern did not change at all. So still a very short stride with their less involved limbs, same pattern of movement, but a lot faster, yes, um, with a different assistive device. Um, you know, Beth made a bold statement, again, saying, you know, we are way more highly trained than to walk with a person with a gait belt and time them. But instead, we should be challenging their discovery um, 
or their, their uh, potential through discovery of different movements, you know, and yes, we would progress their assist device and yes, get them faster, but also really unmask some potential. And um, I, you know, I think that goes for any diagnosis. How easy can we um, easily compensate for things, right? So recently I had a vestibular hypofunction my, myself and to get by in the first couple of days, I had to hold my neck pretty still. And you know what? If I didn't know better, if I didn't have great therapists who were you know, encouraging me to keep moving and trying new things, I probably would have stayed in neck stiff way for quite a while, not even realizing I could push the boundaries more and move a whole lot more until, you know what, last night was the first night in this hotel room, you know how dark they get, I didn't fall in the dark, but I could push those limits. But I could have stayed in my comfort zone and my brain safe zone of not pushing those things. And so I think this applies to every uh, diagnosis. So um, last piece here is what Beth had really recommended was um, instead of a purely biomechanical approach, uh, proposing a movement discovery approach, which has several pieces, and this is something that they had presented at CSM before, um, including things like simply asking a patient, don't do that, try this instead. So a perfect example is, and this is actually in the literature, constraining the trunk. So don't lean forward when you try to reach, but keep your, your back against the chair, and can you reach further? And she had a really really dramatic video where the woman was post-stroke, could not do the reaching task well when she was leaning forward, but when she had her um, back against the backrest and reach there, like all of a sudden she had a beautiful reach. So don't doing that, don't do that, constrain it, modify the task, um, changing the demands of the task, isolating, actually mitigating those impairments or using tactile or even verbal cueing. So this is kind of the model of movement discovery and um, using this as opposed to a, a, a pure task analysis or alongside a task analysis, if that makes sense. So really, really, um, Lovely way to present that. Very challenging to clinical practice. Challenges us as therapists to really use our skills of movement analysis to discover these compensations and think really creatively of how we can change the task, the environment, the cueing, um, ramp it up, ramp it down to unmask potential and go beyond limits no limits for our um, our patients. So it was very inspiring, um, set up for a lot of good discussion, and she was just phenomenal. That's a phenomenal speaker. So what an honor to see that today. Uh, I hope that inspires you to take this um, into practice, to, to push your own, if, you, if you're somebody um, who's working with a physical therapist, to push your own therapist to um, look beyond uh, limits and um, higher potential as well. So we'll see you uh, next week for our next Facebook Live. Thanks for joining today.